Welcome to the Balkan Lecture Series, Episode 6. My name is Johannes Unterguckenberger from the Research Unit of Computer Graphics at TU Wien, Austria, and in this episode we are going to take a deep dive into real-time ray tracing. This is how a real-time ray tracing pipeline looks like, and we have already seen a small example of such a real-time ray tracing pipeline in action during the previous episode, Episode 5, about pipelines and stages. Let us look at the example once again. Let us assume that we have put a small triangle mesh into our acceleration structure and let us further assume that we have put a procedurally described sphere into our acceleration structure. What we can do next is to add an image and in a ray generation shader we are generating one ray per pixel of that image. So that one ray is created and sent through acceleration structure traversal potentially in a massively parallel way if a GPU is used which supports hardware accelerated ray tracing. Let's look at one ray in isolation. The device checks if that ray hit something in the acceleration structure and since it did not hit anything in this case, the miss shader is invoked, which does not modify the original pixel's value in this example. For the neighboring pixel though, the device recognizes during acceleration structure traversal that the ray hits the bounding box of the procedurally described sphere. To find out if the procedurally defined sphere has really been hit, its associated intersection shader is invoked, which must perform a ray sphere intersection in shader code. In our example, the intersection shader reports that the sphere has been hit and therefore the closest hit shader is invoked at the end of the ray tracing pipeline for this particular ray, leading to a green color being computed for the affected pixel. The same geometry instance might be hit by the ray of the neighboring pixel. Also in this case, the intersection shader reports that the sphere has been hit after performing a ray sphere intersection computation and finally the closest hit shader is invoked, again assigning a green color to the pixel, which was the origin of this ray. The next pixel in that row might miss all geometry in the acceleration structure again, leading again to a miss shader invocation. and the ray for the pixel marked on this slide might hit the triangle mesh, which still goes through acceleration structure traversal, but uses an internal intersection shader because the geometry is a triangle mesh and not procedurally described. The closest hit shader is invoked and a color is computed for the affected pixel. And moving one pixel further, Again, the ray intersects the triangle mesh and the closest hit shader computes and assigns a color to the associated pixel. So much for this introductory example. Now let us take a deeper look into some aspects. We will also discuss the any hit shader later, which we have just ignored or actually not required for ray tracing the simple geometry of this example. For now, let us focus on acceleration structures and let's see what we can put into it and how we can construct them. In the chapter about acceleration structures, we need to get more precise about the type of acceleration structure that was used during our initial example on the previous slides. As we will see in a moment, there are actually two types of acceleration structures. The type of this acceleration structure here is a top-level acceleration structure. And such a top-level acceleration structure refers to a set of geometries like the geometry instances shown on the left here, but usually they will contain a lot more geometry than that, like for example a whole 3D scene like the level of a game. But let us also make our example geometry here a bit more interesting by adding more instances of the sphere and using a different triangle mesh. We are using the trunk of a tree as triangle mesh and there are now three instances of the green sphere for the treetop. I deliberately said instances because indeed we can construct this little scene by specifying the sphere only once and making three instances of it which are all scaled and translated differently. And then we have the geometry of the tree as a triangle mesh which we only create one instance of and position that in our scene at a suitable location. These two different base geometries, the sphere and the tree trunk, are stored in a different type of acceleration structure, namely in so-called bottom-level acceleration structures. 
there is a separate bottom level acceleration structure for each of them. And the top level acceleration structure, which represents the whole scene, is composed of different instances of these bottom level acceleration structures. In this example, it is composed of three instances of bottom level acceleration structure number one, where each one of these instances references the actual bottom level acceleration structure. And in addition, we add one instance of the other bottom level acceleration structure. Also in this case, the instance stores a reference to the actual bottom level acceleration structure, which is number two in this case. So, some small amount of data is stored per instance. That means each acceleration structure instance does not only store the reference to the respective bottom level acceleration structure, but also the data listed on this slide, which is a transformation matrix for positioning the acceleration structure instance in the scene, a mask, which can be used to include or exclude this acceleration structure instance from certain ray tracing passes, such as a shadow pass or a reflection pass. This can be freely defined by applications. Some flags, like for example if back faces should also result in a ray hit, or only front faces, or maybe the other way around, depending on which effect an application tries to produce. Then there is an offset parameter, which can be used for shader selection, selecting different shaders from a so-called shader binding table, as we will see a bit later. We can also add a user-defined custom index, which is accessible in shaders through the instance custom index KHR variable, or in GLSL this would be accessible through the built-in variable GL instance custom index ext. We could use this to identify the separate instances in shaders. But we could also use the automatically generated GL instance ID variable to distinguish between instances which refers to the index of acceleration structure instance as specified during top level acceleration structure creation. The acceleration structure instance data must be specified in the form of the struct displayed here on the slide. Its definition can be found in the Vulkan specification. Here, the code has been extended by a short example. An identity transformation is used for the transformation matrix. The custom instance index is set to zero. The mask is set to 0xff, which means that we are not intending to set up any specific ray tracing calls that would exclude this particular acceleration structure instance. The offset for shader selection from the shader binding table is left at zero. For the flags member, VK geometry instance triangle face cal disable is used, which means that rays will hit both front faces and back faces of this acceleration structure instance. And the final parameter is the device address of a bottom level acceleration structure in this example code, which has been queried using VK get acceleration structure device address KHR. And before we move on to acceleration structure traversal and to an in depth look into ray tracing pipelines, let us quickly see how data for building bottom level acceleration structures is provided. The good news here is that this is very similar to how data is provided to draw calls as vertex attributes, like we have seen near the end of episode 4. There, we had an example where geometry was described with this myVertex data struct, containing positions, normals and texture coordinates. We can use the very same data also for building a bottom level acceleration structure. Here we see the relevant code for specifying triangle geometry for a bottom level acceleration structure built. We must use a type provided by the Vulkan API, which is called VK Acceleration Structure Geometry KHR. We ensure to have set the appropriate structure type as usual. We can specify some flags here. In this case, we have specified VK Geometry Opaque as a flag, which avoids any hit shaders to be invoked for this geometry. Now, we haven't talked about any hit shaders yet, but you might want to keep this information in mind for later, or come back to this slide later when we talk about any hit shader invocations. <laughs> 
The geometry type member indicates that we are providing triangle geometry with the following parameters. And for that, we use the appropriate member, which is a union, and tell Vulkan which union member we are populating with data by setting the appropriate S type. The next two members point to the addresses of vertex and index buffers. So, here you can see that we specify indexed triangle mesh geometry for the bottom level acceleration structure built. And for this example, we assume the contents of the vertex buffer to be multiple of such my vertex data instances in contiguous memory. This member tells Vulkan the format of the vertex positions that we are going to provide, which is a 32-bit float for all three coordinates x, y and z. This corresponds to the position member if we assume that our data is stored according to this struct my vertex data. Max vertex means the highest index of a vertex that will be addressed by a build command using this structure. The vertex stride tells the API the distance in bytes from one vertex position to the next one. And the index type tells Vulkan that indices are provided as 4-byte unsigned integers. Procedurally defined geometry can be put together in a similar way. We even use the same type from the Vulkan API, namely VK Acceleration Structure Geometry KHR, but set the geometry type to a different value, which is VK geometry type AABBs. We then use a different union member according to that, specifying the appropriate S type here. And the data that we provide here must again be contained within a buffer, the address of which we can pass here, but the content of the buffer cannot be arbitrarily defined, it must correspond to a type provided by the Vulkan API, namely VK AABB positions KHR or an equivalent type that matches this structure. This type represents the coordinates of an axis aligned bounding box. For our green sphere, this would refer to the green bounding box you see on the slide. So the data pointer must point to data in such a format. And you must specify an appropriate stride also in this case. In our example, subsequent VK AABB positions KHR are tightly packed within the buffer so we pass the size of one VK AABB positions KHR as the stride. So then let us return to the bigger picture. We saw this depiction earlier, which shows how a top-level acceleration structure is composed of multiple instances of potentially different bottom-level acceleration structures. How exactly the acceleration structures are built internally is handled entirely by a device or its driver. So, that is nothing that Vulkan API users must take care of manually. All that is required is to set up everything and initialize their building through calls to VK command build acceleration structures KHR. One for building the bottom level acceleration structure containing the triangle mesh. One for building the axis and bounding box that shall be turned into procedurally described spheres and one for building the top-level acceleration structure based on all the specified acceleration structure instances. So, how exactly each of these acceleration structures is built internally is opaque to Vulkan API users. It is entirely possible that different GPUs end up building completely different acceleration structures, which can lead to different ray tracing performance on different graphics cards for the same scene. It is reasonable to assume that some sort of bounding volume hierarchy is built, which could look like follows for our small example scene. We can see scaled and translated bounding boxes of our input geometry, but the device is free to choose a different way of partitioning space, maybe like follows to have more evenly sized bounding boxes. And there is definitely going to be one big bounding box encompassing the whole scene and whenever you use the top level acceleration structure in your shaders it refers to this whole scene. Utilizing a hierarchical data structure here generally has the big advantage that searches can be performed in logarithmic time. And what we search for within our concrete context is which geometry is hit by a given ray and where. So let us add a ray. <laughs> 
Let us imagine that we have this bounding volume hierarchy available on a GPU and we instruct the GPU to create one ray for each pixel of a target image. Let us observe what happens to the ray associated to the pixel marked in red. In this case, the ray just went by the outermost bounding box. It didn't hit any geometry and all that was required to compute it was one single ray bounding box intersection test, namely with the outermost bounding box. Let us observe a different pixel in our pixel grid, which is located a bit towards the right. This ray intersects with the outermost bounding box, so the GPU must check if there is some geometry contained, which is really hit by the ray. Traversing one level deeper, more bounding boxes are tested for intersections with the ray. The GPU finds out that the ray intersects with two of these bounding boxes and misses all the others. The remaining relevant bounding boxes are one from the tree trunk and one uh, of a tree top. The GPU knows that the bounding box containing the green sphere is a bounding box at leaf level. Which means that it does not contain any other child bounding boxes. Therefore, there is no way of traversing deeper. The GPU performs a check if that ray really hits the sphere which this bounding box represents, or if the ray misses the sphere within this bounding box, which could happen as well. So the GPU performs this intersection test, which in this example requires the execution of a custom intersection shader because our sphere is procedurally described. The intersection shader gets the ray and the bounding box's parameters and calculates where the ray hits the sphere and some more parameters about that hit, such as the surface normal. These parameters are passed back from intersection shaders through so-called hit attributes. So a hit is detected in this case and its coordinates and hit attributes are stored. With that, we return to our overview and a closest hit shader computes a color. We end up with a green color for this pixel corresponding to the treetop, which ended up being the so-called closest hit for this ray, because its hit position is closer to the ray origin than a potential hit with the tree trunk behind it. We will now see how to create one ray and take a deep dive into how one ray is processed by a ray tracing pipeline. Let us start with some GLSL shader code, which shows how one single ray is created. The GLSL function traceRayX creates one ray and sends it through a ray tracing pipeline. This ray immediately starts to go through acceleration structure traversal, as we have seen during the example on the previous slides. The example source code shows how to spawn one ray and store the result in an image. We can see that the GLX ray tracing extension is required. Please mind that the GL here refers to GLSL, but not to OpenGL, which still has no support for real-time ray tracing. An important resource here is the acceleration structure, which can be made accessible in GLSL shaders through a declaration as shown on the slide. The Image2D resource is the output image which gets the resulting color values assigned after tracing the ray has completed. And here we see the traceRayX function being invoked, which creates one ray according to its parameters and initiates its processing according to the associated ray tracing pipeline. It takes as parameters the top level acceleration structure, configuration parameters, flags and the culling mask, where the former is used in this example code to specify that geometries are behaving as if they were opaque even if something different was specified during acceleration structure creation. The latter can be used to ignore some acceleration structure instances from being regarded during ray tracing, which is not the case in this example code though, since the mask of 0xFF includes all bits of possible masks. These parameters refer to offsets into a so-called shader binding table. We will see a bit later what exactly that is. <laughs> 
just keep in mind for now that there are different parameters like offset and stride that can be specified with trace rex which are relevant for access into a shader binding table. The last parameter refers to the so-called ray payload, which is user-defined, must be declared as shown right above the main function and contains the resulting color value as determined in the closest hit shader here in this example. And its content is directly stored in the output image. Next, let us take a deeper look at what happens within trace rayx. Between its invocation and the return of the control flow, a ray is processed according to the scheme presented on the following slides, invoking possibly many different shaders along the way and, of course, also depending on the used scene which is passed to trace ray X through the top-level acceleration structure. We have two big sections between invocation and its return, namely the acceleration structure traversal loop and ray shading and we'll continue with the latter, where we see two possible paths, namely either the invocation of the closest hit shader or the invocation of the miss shader. That means either of the two will be invoked right before returning from trace ray X. We can see that the decision depends on whether some acceleration structure instance was hit or not. If an acceleration structure instance was hit by a ray, the closest hit shader is invoked. In a way, this can be seen as the equivalent to a fragment shader because typically the computations performed will be somewhat similar. The miss shader is invoked when no acceleration structure instance has been hit. An example for what a miss shader could compute would be sampling a skybox texture because no acceleration structure instance was hit. Now let us continue on the other side and see how the underlying functionality of trace rex starts. A given top-level acceleration structure is traversed and the vendor-specific implementation of this process checks if there is some acceleration structure instance contained that intersects the given ray. If there isn't any acceleration structure instance which bounds are intersected by the ray, we already bail out of the acceleration structure traversal loop without any hit. But if a bounding box is hit, an intersection shader is invoked which computes if an acceleration structure instance has really been hit or not. In the case of our spheres, used previously as treetop, this would mean the invocation of a custom intersection shader. But if the geometry is provided as triangle mesh, such as the tree trunk used in our example previously, a built-in intersection shader is used. So, Ray triangle intersections do not have to be implemented manually, but they are provided out of the box. Since many of such intersections will have to be computed for more complex scenes, hardware vendors typically try to accelerate this process as much as possible, often offering hardware acceleration for it, which is actually the reason why all of this is usable for big scenes in current games in the first place. Since some implementation details vary between different vendors, and also because not every GPU accelerates the same operations in the same manner, you will see different performance characteristics across different vendors or different devices. But back to the intersection shader. Its job is to compute if the ray intersects an acceleration structure instance within its given bounds or not. If it doesn't, the GPU just continues searching the acceleration structure for further possible candidates. If, on the other hand, the intersection shader determines that the ray hits, it must be checked if the new hit also is the closest hit. That means, if the new hit's coordinates are closer to the origin of the ray than the previous hit. That means, internally, the current closest hit is remembered and new hits are compared to the current closest hit. Also in this case, if the new hit is not the closest hit and therefore the hit is irrelevant, searching the acceleration structure continues. If however, the new hit is indeed the first or new closest hit, the device checks if the associated acceleration structure instance is completely opaque, which is declared through its flags, but also the absence of any hit shaders would lead to an instance being considered opaque. So, if an opaque object has been hit, 
The new closest hit is set as the current closest hit, which is remembered in some internal data structure. Please mind the arrows back to the acceleration structure traversal step in this case, which means that the search for more hits continues, because there might still be some acceleration structure instances closer than the currently set closest hit. If, however, the instance is not opaque, an any hit shader gets invoked. Within such an any hit shader, we can handle transparency in some way, which makes sense in the context of an application. You can decide to accept the hit or ignore the hit. If we decide to accept the hit in the any hit shader, it is handled in the same way as an opaque hit, replacing the current closest hit with the new hit. But we can also decide to not set the new hit as closest hit, which would be suitable for situations where we want to temporarily store information about some transparent object and evaluate that stored transparency information later in either the closest hit shader or the miss shader. At some point, acceleration structure traversal will have checked all potential bounding boxes within the acceleration structure, so control flow leaves the acceleration structure traversal loop. The current and hence latest closest hit data is evaluated and depending on it, a closest hit shader or a miss shader is invoked. This concludes our deep dive into trace ray ext and ray tracing pipeline traversal. Just remember that everything we saw during our deep dive happens between the invocation of trace ray ext and control flow returning from it. Now, let us see how to create the multitude of rays required for generating a whole ray traced image. We now turn our focus from device code to host code, where we can instruct the generation of a whole array of rays through the function vk command trace rays khr. At the bottom of the slide, we see this host code function vk command trace race khr highlighted. This command instructs the instantiation of multiple rate generation shader threads, namely 2,073,600 invocations for the code on this slide to be precise, corresponding to the output image's full HD resolution. Please mind the usage of the singular in the GLSL function trace ray ext because it refers to one and only one ray. In contrast, the plural is used for the function name of vk command trace rays khr. Now let us turn our attention to all of these offsets, strides and addresses. There are offsets and stride parameters passed to the call to trace ray ext. And there are start addresses passed to the call to vk command trace rays khr. Both control access to a so-called shader binding table. The shader binding table is used during ray tracing for looking up which shaders to use during ray tracing pipeline traversal for different acceleration structure instances. The offsets passed to vk command trace race khr refer to rows of the shader binding table. Every shader that can be used during rendering with a ray tracing pipeline must be contained within the shader binding table. And with the parameters to vk command trace race khr and to trace ray ext, we can specify which shaders get selected. As parameters to vk command trace race khr, we specify the start addresses where to find shaders. We could place the rate generation shader right at the top of our shader binding table, passing the appropriate address to the highlighted parameter. But we can put it somewhere else in the shader binding table as well. Generally, we don't even have to stick to contiguous memory for the shader binding table. We just need to put the shaders in suitable buffers. But for the course of this episode, I will stick to putting everything into one contiguous table. Moving on to further shader binding table entries for shading our acceleration structure instances that we used to create the top level acceleration structure, we would like to use different shaders for the different types of geometry that we have used. In fact, we must use different shaders for these two because one is procedurally described and the other one is a triangle mesh. In the former case, 
An intersection shader must be included in the set of shaders to be used, but not in the latter case. So we need two more entries in our shader binding table and we need to specify the proper start address with our call to vk command trace race khr. These entries are called hit groups because they represent shaders which are used in the case of array hitting some bounding boxes or geometry and because they come in a group of shaders which can consist of only one shader or up to three shaders which are to be used in conjunction for a certain hit. If you remember back to some of the earlier slides in this episode, the offset parameter was mentioned, which can be used to offset shader selection for different acceleration structure instances. So that means one instance of the sphere could use a different row from the shader binding table than other instances. While this parameter is not being used in our very small shader binding table on this slide here, we will see it in action on a later slide for a different example. We move on to a final essential entry in our very small shader binding table example here for the case of the ray missing all of the acceleration structure instances. For which case, we have to specify where one or multiple miss shaders can be found in device memory. The start addresses all have to be specified as device addresses, which can be retrieved using vkgetBufferDeviceAddress. The offsets are byte offsets, not index offsets. The code on the slide shows hard-coded byte strides of 32 being used for each of the address regions, but in a real-world application, these should be queried from the actual physical device properties. And then, don't forget to multiply the size entries with the queried bytes as well to compute size members in byte too. Okay. So before we move on to a bigger example for a shader binding table, let us summarize some important information about the shader binding table on one slide. The shader binding table is a buffer that needs to be created with special flags, namely VK buffer usage shader binding table bit and VK buffer usage shader device address bit. The latter flag means that we can retrieve the buffer's device address through the function VK get buffer device address and this address, or this address plus offsets, is passed to the parameters of wiki command trace race khr. One shader binding table entry refers to either one shader or a combination of two or three shaders. Such an entry is called a shader group. It is further distinguished between general groups and hit groups. Some examples would be One entry might contain one single ray generation shader a general group containing only one shader. One entry might contain one single miss shader, a general group as well. For cases where array hits geometry, so-called hit groups can be defined. It can be that hit groups consist of no more than one shader, like for opaque triangle meshes, where specifying one single closest hit shader is sufficient. Hit groups for triangle meshes are called triangle hit groups. For transparent triangle meshes, we would combine a closest hit shader and an any hit shader into a triangle hit group. And for procedurally described geometry, we have to add an intersection shader. The hit group is called procedural hit group in this case. For a procedural hit group, we might need to use all three entries of a shader binding table record if it is intended to be used for rendering transparent objects. So in this case, we would add a closest hit shader, an any hit shader, and an intersection shader to one shader binding table entry. Let us now turn to a bigger example where we construct a suitable shader binding table for the scene on the slide. Our example rays will be spawned from our camera, which is positioned here. Let us add a shader binding table now, which we will fill with entries one by one in order to construct one which is suitable for this scene. At the top, the parameters to VK command trace race khr are shown, which are all specified as addresses with respect to a common start address, referring to the buffer behind our shader binding table here. Ray generation shaders are declared to be located right at the start of the shader binding table offsetting their start address by zero bytes. So 
Let us install one concrete ray generation shader here as a general group containing only one single shader. It will initiate the creation of several rays, each of which is created in shader code through trace ray -ext. The function call that we can use initially takes all zeros for the parameters record offset, record stride and miss index respectively. Before we move on, let us see how the other two start address parameters to the host set call to vk command trace race khr are set up in our example. The start address for the hit groups is offset by one times stride bytes from the shader binding table buffers start address. And the miss shaders start at an offset of 14 times stride bytes from the shader binding table buffers start address. Okay, now with that setup, let us add one shader binding table entry at a time and see which ray this would be useful for. One triangle hit group is added, which contains only one single closest hit shader, which is called shade terrain. It shall be used for triangle meshes, why we rely on the built-in triangles in the section shader. We would like this shader to be used when a ray hits the terrain and the terrain ends up being the closest hit. Another triangle hit group has been added, also this time consisting of only one closest hit shader, which shall be used if the treasure ends up being the closest hit. We add another triangle hit group with only one closest hit shader, which we would like to use for shading the trunk of the palm tree. So the question arises, how can we establish a setup that our real-time ray tracing pipeline selects the proper shader for each one of these objects? And we have already seen the answer on a previous slide. Using the offset parameter declared per acceleration structure instance, we can redirect lookup in the shader binding table according to our needs. The full name of the offset parameter is instance shader binding table record offset and it is highlighted on the slide. So when building the top level acceleration structure for our example scene, we just specify different values for these offset parameters. An offset of zero for the terrain, an offset of one for the treasure and an offset of two for the palm tree trunk. That problem is solved, but another problem arises in our example. Assume that the entire palm tree is contained within the same bottom level acceleration structure, but it consists of two sub meshes, one for the trunk and one for the leaves. When a ray hits the leaves, we would like to use an any hit shader to determine if an actual leaf has been hit, assume, assuming that an alpha texture must be sampled to get to this information. And we'd like to use a different closest hit shader as well, possibly utilizing a different shading model. A suitable triangle hit group is added to the shader binding table, but since palm tree trunk and leaves have the same offset assigned, namely 2, we need a different way for selecting a different shader binding table entry. And to achieve that, we need to change one of TraceRayX's parameters from 0 to 1, namely the shader binding table record stride parameter. For the reason why this has the desired effect in our example, we need to look at the complete rule to compute a hit group record address. It can be seen that the start address and the byte stride parameter to the host site vk command trace race khr represent the base for the following computations within the parentheses. Then we have the offset as part of the equation that we have utilized for selecting different shader binding table entries for terrain, treasure and palm tree. The selection of a hit group record address can be offset further through the SPD record offset parameter of trace ray -ext, which is the first one of the three shown values and still left at zero in the example at the top right. The parameter that we have changed to one is the SPD record stride variable in the equation and it enables the geometry index taken into account, which is the variable printed in green. The geometry index refers to the different geometries that a bottom level acceleration structure consists of, 
This could be, for example, different sub-meshes of a 3D model. The first geometry gets index 0, the second index 1, and so on. How this is done in code has already been partly shown previously in this episode, on slides 35 and following. We saw triangle geometry being prepared for bottom-level acceleration structure building as shown in this piece of code. And at some point, multiple of such VK acceleration structure geometry KHR instances are bundled into another configuration struct just before being handed over to the build instruction. In this piece of code, there is only one geometry specified, so the triangle geometry instance at the top corresponds to geometry index 0. But you could also pass a lot more geometries, like for example a hundred and they get ascending indices assigned. So by setting SPD record stride to 1, Geometry Index contributes to the resulting shader binding table record selection for hit groups. Let us move on and add further entries to our shader binding table. Let us add one for the clouds. The clouds have an any hit shader to handle their transparent appearance. The second shader in this procedural hit group is called procedural clouds. It performs intersection testing of a given ray with the procedurally generated shape of the cloud. If the ray hits its excellent bounding box. Now, attention about the offset for the cloud. We need to assign it an offset of 4, not 3. Because for the geometry at offset 2, the palm tree's trunk and leaves, we used two entries in the shader binding table. With clouds having no closest hit shader, the situation here on the slide is not entirely correct, since the ray that intersects the cloud's bounding box will definitely continue beyond the cloud, like so. The ray eventually misses all the geometry in the scene after continuing, and since there is no closest hit shader for this case, we need a miss shader. Let's add one to the table at the start address of miss shader entries, which is at index 14. This is, of course, also invoked if a ray did not hit anything, not even clouds along the way. The miss shader is called set skybox color, and it samples some color from a skybox, maybe an environment map. So far, we have evaluated only the first hits of rays. Or in the case of the clouds, we just let the same ray continue. But now, let us prepare the shader binding table for recursive rays, which can be used to generate reflections or shadows. Recursive rays can be spawned by the invocation of trace ray X, not only in ray generation shaders, but in other ray tracing shaders. Not all of them support spawning new rays, though. Besides the ray generation shader, only closest hit and miss shaders allow the creation of recursive rays within a ray tracing pipeline through calls to trace ray X. So that means that recursive rays can only be created by the shaders outside of that acceleration structure traversal loop region. Now let us prepare our shader binding table for recursive rays. And as a first step for that, let us add some shaders for the water surface. The new entry consists of a closest hit shader called Shade Water Surface and a custom intersection shader called Procedural Water. To select the proper entry from the shader binding table, we assign the water geometry an offset of 5. Rays that hit the water surface shall add both reflection and refraction. Therefore, we are going to spawn two, a reflection ray and a refraction ray in the shade water surface closest hit shader. First, let us consider refraction. In our example, we assume to have only two objects that can exist underwater, namely the terrain and the fish. And we would like these to be shaded using special underwater shaders, which have already been added to the shader binding table at indices 7 and 8. So what we do is to create a new recursive ray within the shade water surface closest hit shader for every ray that hits the water surface. A new ray is created by invoking trace ray X from within that closest hit shader, but we need to specify different parameters now to offset shader lookup within the shader binding table. 
we can see that we plan to use a different hit group for shading the terrain underwater, namely that at index 7. This hit group should be used instead of the hit group at index 1, so we must set the parameters to trace react so that hit group shader lookup is offset by 6 indices. The appropriate parameters to trace react for the recursive refraction rays are 6, 0, 0, where 6 refers to the shader binding table record offset parameter or SPD record offset as called on the previous slides. The parameters of the recursive trace ray x replace the parameters of the former rays trace ray x, which influences the calculations of the rule to compute a hit group record address. So the parameters 0, 1, 0 are replaced by 6, 0, 0 for this calculation. This change affects the SPD record offset and SPD record stride, which in turn influence the rule for hit group record address calculation according to the two marked parts. What is still left to ensure is that the right shaders are selected for the different objects. Let us see if we can manage to set this up through the offsets again. The offset is defined at acceleration structure creation time, so it remains zero for the terrain, which is fine because we have supplied an offset of 6 to trace ray x. Adding this to the offset of 1 from vk command trace ray khr at the top results in the shader binding table entry at index 7, so all good here. And assigning the fish instance an offset of 1 ensures the proper shader for this object being selected as well. Let us now add a reflection ray. The reflection ray shall use the same shaders as the rays that we have used before for shading objects above the water surface. Therefore, a recursive trace ray x with parameters 0, 1, 0 is suitable in this case. It will again use the hit groups from indices 1 to 5. Let us now complete our shader binding table to support another type of recursive rays, namely rays for producing shadows with respect to our light source in the scene. From every closest hit shader, we create another ray for determining whether the hit point is in shadow or not by sending a ray from the hit point towards the light source. If the ray intersects other geometry, the hit point is in shadow. If it doesn't, there's no shadow to be added. Let's now add the shaders for this functionality. We have added another 5 hit groups and also another miss shader. Many of the hit groups use the same closest hit shader, namely add shadow. It just stores the information in a ray payload that the origin point is to be shaded with some added shadow. Five entries have been added to the shader binding table for achieving this, to match the structure from further above, namely indices 1 to 5. After all, the offsets defined during acceleration structure creation still remain the same, so we need to ensure that the rule for computing hit group record addresses still computes valid indices, given that we would like the entries at indices 12 and 13 staying true to the underlying geometry, namely checking an alpha texture in the case of the palm tree leaves and adding some translucent shadows from clouds respectively. Please note that this example is set up so that only the objects above the water surface can cast shadows. But of course it could be extended to underwater. Given that we know that only certain types of instances can cast shadows, we could use those masks that were mentioned earlier to only include the relevant objects when casting shadow rays. This can be achieved by defining a value for the mask parameter during acceleration structure creation and making sure to use a cal mask when invoking trace ray x which includes only the objects that can cast shadows, but doesn't include other objects. This can save performance, or it might even be required for ensuring correctness. So, what are the parameters for the recursive trace reacts for the purpose of creating shadows in this example? 
suitable parameters would be value 8 for the SPT record offset to start shader selection at index 9, value 1 for the SPT record stride to get the desired behavior for the submeshes of the palm tree, and value 1 for the offset to miss shader selection. The rule for computing miss shader indices within the shader binding table is simpler than the rule for hit groups. It regards the start address and byte stride parameters of VK command trace rays KHR and the miss index parameter of trace ray X. This concludes our example. We have one more small chapter in this episode, namely ray query. A ray query is, so to say, acceleration structure traversal on foot. It does not support shader binding tables, but it can be used in any shader stage. RayQuery requires the VKKHR acceleration structure extension, but not the VKKHR ray tracing pipeline extension. And of course, also VKKHR RayQuery must be enabled. So, it means that it supports access to an acceleration structure from other shader stages, including compute shaders, fragment shaders, and others. But as already hinted, it does not execute a full ray tracing pipeline with intersection shaders and the shader binding table as we have seen previously in this episode. But these situations can be handled in a manual fashion. Compared to the full ray tracing pipeline, one big difference is that no custom shaders are executed or supported. So that means instead of the ray shading section, we just get a yes-no result. So when the control flow returns to the user of a ray query, just the information about whether we have a hit or not is provided, but no closest hit or miss shaders are invoked. Furthermore, also the inner custom shader stages are replaced with returns of the control flow to the using code plus a status. Now we see that all custom shaders are gone from the diagram and have been replaced with multiple calls to ray query proceed X each returning a status representing the current situation. Let us take a quick look at how this could look like in code. After initializing a ray query with partly the same parameters as used in trace ray X, most notably also passing a top level acceleration structure to ray query initialize, we can see the multiple calls to ray query proceed X. It is invoked in a loop and depending on the status returned by it, we can react in code manually, like for example handling intersections or evaluating if the ray has finally hit or missed. Alright, so much for ray query, which can be quite useful in situations where not a fully fledged ray tracing pipeline with a whole shader binding table is necessary. And with that, we have reached the end of this episode, where we have covered a lot of ground in terms of real-time ray tracing functionality on modern GPUs, and we have seen how this functionality can be used with the Vulkan API. We have learned about acceleration structures, took a deep dive into the inner control flow of ray tracing pipelines, saw how shader binding tables can be set up, and finally learned about a more bare-bones way of intersecting a ray with an acceleration structure, namely ray query. I hope that you found the provided information helpful and I thank you for your attention.